Good morning. Thank you, John Mark and your colleagues at Nomura Code, as well as Cleantech Investor. It's exciting to have a fuel cell industry day. And what I'd like to do is give you some background on fuel cell energy. Before I do so, we are publicly held. I encourage you to acquaint yourselves with our safe harbor statement. So it's probably helpful to start off with who we are. So when you think about fuel cell energy, we're megawatt class, we're stationary, we're baseload power. We utilize carbonate fuel cell technology for our commercial power plants. With that, we have 47% electrical efficiency or higher with hybrid installations. We also generate high quality heat suitable for making steam. So we have combined heat and power capabilities. We utilize natural gas or renewable biogas as our fuel source. Within that carbonate fuel cell, we internally reform that fuel to obtain the hydrogen we need. So as long as there's a readily available natural gas network, we can, uh, we can put in one of our plants. Our plants are scalable, they're easy to site, and we are European. We have sales and service in Dresden, Germany, and local assembly and manufacturing in a town called Autobrunn, which is outside of Munich. And we are also London. The Crown Estates is a customer of ours, and we have an installation at Regent Street. What the Crown Estates was attracted to was the high efficiency, the low carbon footprint, the virtual lack of pollutants, and the quiet operation that enabled siting within the building itself. So we're a fully integrated fuel cell company. We design and manufacture the fuel cell power plants, we install them, and then we also service them. We have long-term service contracts with customers up to 20 years. We'll monitor and maintain the plants for them. So they do not need to become fuel cell experts. We have about 180 megawatts installed base or in backlog, and we're working with our South Korean partner to close a memorandum of agreement for another 120 megawatts order. We sell both to on-site power users as well as utilities for grid support. And what we found as we develop a market is we often start off with sub-megawatt units. That's what we see in Germany, that's what we see in the UK right now. Then we progress to megawatt class installations, which is what we're seeing in the United States right now. And then our units are very scalable and we get to multi-megawatt fuel cell parks which is what you see in South Korea. So the bottom right there is an 11 megawatt fuel cell park in South Korea that's supporting the utility grid in Korea. Our vision is to price below the electric grid without incentives. And that's a key aspect. We want to be able to stand on our own two feet and we have a clear path through volume to get our pricing down. So let me throw some numbers at you to help explain this. We have a manufacturing facility in Connecticut about an hour and a half outside of New York City that has an annual capacity of up to 90 megawatts. The bricks and mortar are there, the equipment's there. At 50 to 55 megawatts annual production, we generate a nominal gross profit. At 80 to 90 megawatts of annual production, we're net income break even to a modest net profit. So what we really are is a volume story. As we grow our volume, we need to add a little bit of direct labor and the capacity is already there. So let me talk a little bit about what some of the markets are that are going to help us grow that volume. Looking at our markets by fuel source, we have seven markets we've identified on natural gas and four on renewable biogas. We estimate it's about a $12 billion market midterm opportunity. And what you'll notice is service is a dollar for dollar opportunity. We like service. It's consistent revenues and it helps us stay tight with our customers so we can sell additional products with them. Um, John Mark mentioned that Pike Research is here. They put out a report recently, and as they looked at stationary market over the next five years, I think their numbers were consistent with what we had here or maybe even a little bit higher. So we sell to end users. We sell to project developers. A project developer may be a financier that buys the power plant and then sells the power under a long-term power purchase agreement to the end user. We have attractive economics that, can, that, that are compelling to project financiers. In addition, we sell to utilities. They put the power plants under a rate-based model. Our leading markets right now are South Korea and California. What we look for in a market is really three things. One is high-cost power regions. Two is regulatory support. And three is a market that puts value on clean power. That's kind of the challenge for us, and I probably can say the industry as a whole, is how do you monetize the lack of pollutants? So in the US, you look at the coasts. 
California, the Northeast. High population density, uh, need for new power, supportive regulatory environments, and particularly you look at a market like California, very strict clean air permitting. So it's a very good market for us. We have expanding opportunities in Europe and Asia as well. So in Europe, England, Spain, and Germany are our near-term focus, and we either have installations or contracts in each of those countries. In Asia, South Korea is our biggest market. We're getting into Indonesia through our South Korean partner, and Japan certainly offers compelling opportunities that we're exploring. So in Asia, South, South Korea is really a global leader in the adoption of clean power. And why is that? They want to reduce their carbon footprint, they want to reduce their dependency on imported fuels, and they're really using renewable power as an economic driver. They want to create jobs. So they've adopted a very aggressive renewable portfolio standard. Right now they're achieving about 2% of their power generation from new and renewable power sources, and they want to increase that up to 10% by the year 2022. So what that means is about 350 megawatts a year of renewable and new power adoption through 2016, growing to 700 megawatts through 2022. In addition, the city of Seoul has announced a program. They want to use fuel cells for their uh, subway system for wastewater treatment. When you think about the climate and topography of South Korea, solar and wind are certainly part of the solution, but not by themselves. They really like the baseload distributed generation. They really like the, the, the lack of pollutants. And you remember that picture from the beginning, that 11 megawatt fuel cell park? That takes about an acre. So when you think about an urban environment, you can usually find in an industrial section an acre here, an acre there, 10 megawatts here, 10 megawatts there, and you're really supplementing your grid without having to invest in big central generation. So POSCO Energy is a wholly owned subsidiary of POSCO Steel, one of the world's largest steel companies. And they own about 17% of fuel cell energy common stock. We're working with them on a 120 megawatt order. We've announced a memorandum of agreement that we expect to close in 2012. And what's exciting about that agreement is it's going to give us consistent production level through 2016. So as you think about us ramping up to 90 megawatts, 40 to 50 megawatts can come just from this consistent demand from South Korea. In addition, we're speaking with, or negotiating with POSCO on local manufacturing. It's always good to produce close to your customer, more responsive, you can fine tune the product for local needs, and then it would give us a second source of supply. But really a key aspect of that is, is we get towards 210 megawatts of annual production, that's going to get us down to the 9 to 11 cents per kilowatt hour that's our vision that we see will be very grid competitive that will really drive adoption. So whether we're producing in the USA or South Korea or in Europe in the future, we have a global supply chain. We buy a lot of powdered nickel, which is our catalyst. We buy a lot of stainless steel. And it doesn't matter where we're producing, we're buying from the same people. And the more we buy, and with greater consistency, the lower our costs become. Now in Europe, clear need for clean baseload distributed generation. Here in the UK, you see aggressive carbon reduction targets. In Germany, you see uh, moving away from nuclear. So what we have is a two-pronged approach as we, uh, as we develop the European market. We have a joint venture in Germany with Fraunhofer, an applied research organization. We own 75% of the joint venture. We contribute technology, sales, and marketing. Uh, Fraunhofer has 25%. They're contributing their extensive R&D resources to help us further enhance our existing technology. And more importantly, they're, they're contributing their relationships. So to illustrate that, we first announced this, this uh, partnership with Fraunhofer in February of 2012. And by August of 2012, we announced our first sale, which was a fuel cell power plant to a federal ministry building in Berlin. So they helped to, uh, help to open doors for us, if you will. In addition, we have a non-exclusive partnership with Spanish-based Abengoa. As you may know, Abengoa is a leader in liquid biofuels. They have a strong presence in Spain and also in Latin America. So they're very intrigued with our technology from a liquid biofuel application and renewable <coughs> biogas. And you think about something like sugarcane ethanol in Brazil, that's a potential market that we're exploring together. So what we try to do is take the technology we have and work with partners that can help us leverage 
that provide market resources, that provide access to new markets, that provide relationships. In North America, we have some good near-term opportunities in the state of Connecticut. These are both on-site power applications as well as utility grid support. California is a very good market for us. We have two of the largest electric utilities there as customers that have purchased plants and put them as part of their rate base. Wastewater treatment facilities on renewable biogas and universities are also good applications for us in California. In Hawaii, we have a, uh, a relationship with General Motors that we're, we're trying to figure out some applications there. New Jersey recently adopted some supportive regulatory uh, policies for stationary fuel cells as well. So what does this all cost? If you look at the top right, our levelized cost of electricity breaks down that about a third of it is capital costs, a little less than a third is O&M, operating and maintenance and then a little over a third are fuel costs. So right now, we're around 14 to 15 cents a kilowatt hour, assuming natural gas at six to eight dollars per million BTU. Six to eight dollars, we, we, we can argue what's the appropriate price. It's maybe a little light for the US. It's, it, it maybe needs to be a little bit higher for Europe and, and, and certainly higher for Asia. But basically, a two dollar move in gas equates to about a penny per kilowatt hour. So what this means is we're, we're right on the cusp, we're right on the verge. A high cost power state like New York is about 14 cents a kilowatt hour. So incentives help get us below the grid, but of course we want to move away from incentives. Here in the UK, industrial power prices are maybe around 12 cents, California is around 12 cents. So we do need to get prices down a little bit more and the volume is what's going to help us do that. And then the other point I'd like to make on this chart is we've added in transmission and distribution for these central generation alternatives. Remember, a key aspect of distributed generation is you don't need to invest or maintain transmission lines. And research we've seen, that can add up to 2.4 cents a kilowatt hour. So if somebody's quoting coal-fired power price that is very low, well, that does not include the cost to public health of emissions, and typically it does not include T and D. So we try to highlight those differences. So the chart on the top right, our first commercial power plant installation was in 2003, and our product cost was about $10,000 a kilowatt. Through product redesign, through technology enhancement, greater power output, longer fuel cell stack life, we're now down to less than $3,000 a kilowatt. And when you look at the lower left, I've been talking about volume. That's what's going to help us drive costs below $2,500 a kilowatt. <laughs> Plus, we think there's some more technology enhancement we can do. We can get a little more power output. We can get a little longer of a fuel cell stack life. So as we work to close that 120 megawatt order with our South Korean partner, what that's really going to do is give us a good, consistent, stable production level through 2016. So at 50 to 60 megawatts of annual production, that in essence locks in our gross margin break even. So that comes both from the, the order with POSCO as well as scheduled restacks with our customers under long-term service agreements. And then growth from the US and Europe is what will help get us to, to profitability with that 80 to 90 megawatts of annual production. Now we also have a group called Advanced Technologies. These are some of our smartest PhDs that work on new applications for our existing technology. When you think about carbonate technology, the word that, that we really want you to think about is versatile. It's a very versatile technology. And I won't go through all three of these, but this, this top one is really kind of an interesting application because it's a way to generate renewable hydrogen for vehicle fueling. So we have an installation in Southern California at a wastewater treatment plant. We're taking the renewable biogas and we're turning that into clean electricity and high quality heat that the wastewater treatment plant uses as part of their process. Now with our fuel cell technology, we do not utilize all the hydrogen we generate. So that excess hydrogen, we're providing to our partner in this project, Air Products, which is a global gas distribution company. And they've built a hydrogen fueling station on the edge of the property, which happens to be next to an on-ramp to a major interstate freeway. So what we've done is demonstrated a distributed generation of hydrogen and done it in a fashion that's renewable. So it's attracted a lot of attention from industry, attracted a lot of attention from government. 
So in closing, we have a large market. We're an established company, 180 megawatts installed base. We've got good solid partners that are helping us expand the market. We've got a clear path towards profitability based on volume. We've already made the investment into, into capacity and now it becomes getting the orders closed. We have a number of catalysts and a variety of markets to do that. And uh, we have a strong cash position, over $70 million at the end of our most recent quarter end. And we feel we're well positioned for growth. So John Mark, do I have time for questions? Um, we'll do questions after the last presentation from Dave Flanagan from UTC Power. Thank you. Cheers.